Welcome back to the Pilots Lounge. On today's episode, we are joined by Dave Callen, former Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department pilot and TFO for their air support unit who went on to co-found SR3 Rescue Concepts. SR3 travels across the nation and internationally consulting and training organizations to conduct safer, more efficient operations. SR3 services range everything from assisting a new organization with starting their air support unit and what equipment they might need to successfully complete those operations, all the way through traveling to train, advise, and assist, you know, everything from law enforcement to military units in conducting those operations in a safer manner. SR3 offers, you know, professional training in the areas of helicopter rescue, mountain rescue, as well as tactical medicine, and will assist units in performing safety audits should that be a requirement. Today, Dave dives into his story and background, how SR3 was founded, as well as the impact that SR3 is having on organizations around the world. From wherever you are listening, sit back, grab your cup of coffee, and thanks for joining us on the Pilots Lounge. What's going on, Bertellian? This is John Gray, host of the Hangar Z Podcast. We love the Pilots Lounge Podcast and know you do as well. Hey, when you're done here, come check out the Hangar Z Podcast. We're the first and only podcast promoting the personnel and equipment behind the missions in public safety aviation. You can find us at HangarZPodcast.com or anywhere where you listen to podcasts. Welcome back to the Pilots Lounge. On today's episode, we are joined by Dave Callen, a retired sergeant from the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department who went on to co-found SR3 Rescue Concepts, which we'll dive into today. Dave brings us a multitude of experience flying everything from search and rescue, surveillance, tactical missions, short haul long line, and a multitude of other things, and is qualified in the H145, HH1H, MD530 Fox, Bell 407, is a CFI, NVG flight instructor, over 4,000 hours, an incredible list of accolades that we're going to let you dive into when when we talk a little bit about your story. But Dave, welcome and thank you for joining us. Awesome, man. It's an honor to be here chatting with you guys. And uh, yeah, appreciate the invitation. Absolutely. You know, our original time, uh, the first time we met you was down at HAI. I believe you talked to to Spencer. And then when Spencer and I were kind of roaming around trying to find our purpose in the massive expo that that was, I remember we, we ran across the, uh, SR three booth and it was really cool to see, you know, just how, how much interaction that you guys have with the community. It seems like a lot of these EMS and police departments kind of gravitate towards your organization. And we got a little bit of that from Jason Quinn and, and talking to him about some of the stuff that he does with you guys, but we will dive into that and more. First, we're going to knock out what we do, uh, on the pilot cylinder is just table talk. And you'll, you'll kind of quickly get the idea of our version of table talk. We're not going to ask you emergency procedures or limitations or anything like that. Uh, but usually Spencer and Brett have, have some pretty good ones. So I'll let them uh, kick it off. Spence, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, I've got two for you. Um, we'll start with um, my favorite, which is what, if you do partake in the consumption of adult beverages, what's your uh, favorite dive bar or just bar in general anywhere in the world? Oh man. So that's a good one. Um, so I, I pretty much spent the majority of my life in Vegas and, um, moved out to Georgia. I'm actually living in Georgia now. I've been out here just, uh, just over three years. Um, and there's a lot of great spots that I hung out in, in Vegas. Um, but there's, uh, there's actually, um, some really good breweries around here and, uh, where I'm currently living. So, um, yeah, I would have to go, believe it or not, I'd have to go <laughs> with a local spot here. Um, there's, uh, God, man, there, there's a really cool place, uh, in the downtown area of Fayetteville, just North of Peachtree city, um, where I live. And it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like in a cool, like area that they're building up right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, basically it's kind of like a bar combined with a, uh, there's like a barbecue joint mix in there as well. Um, and they make a whole bunch of, yeah, kinds of, um, awesome beers, uh, but it's called line Creek. It's line Creek brewing and they've got a really awesome IPA called first crush that I drink a ton of down here. So yeah, I'd have to go hundred percent with line Creek down here in uh, Fayetteville and Peachtree city. Line Creek brewing Fayetteville, Georgia. That's it. 
We have an ongoing Sweet. list. It's Thanks, actually brother. published on our website. Um, they, we've collected and, and we, we publish everything that way. If people find themselves traveling around and, and find themselves in one of those cities that they can, they can look and see what, uh, what's there, but Brett, go ahead. I can see your face. You're ready. <laughs> well, no, I, Spencer has another one, but, uh, I was going to say IPA guy. Interesting. Spence is more of a Bud Light guy. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> My condolences. <laughs> uh, we'll dive into that today. Yeah. Uh, definitely more of a Coors Light, Miller Light kind of guy. But regardless, uh, the second one on the topic of, uh, of drinking, if you could have a drink and a conversation with anybody, dead or alive, um, who would that be and why? Oh, man. Um, damn, that's what, you guys got some really good questions here, man. Um, Man, that's a tough one. Ah, jeez, you know. Man, I would have to go with. Honestly, it'd probably be Chuck Yeager, and I'd probably want to knock back a bourbon with the dude and just like hear not only the epic war stories, but like, you know, back in the days when those guys were like, you know, doing like all the the crazy test pilot stuff not only with breaking the sound barrier but just like you know that whole process those guys just had like balls of steel man so i think it would be pretty it'd be pretty badass to sit down with that guy and just talk about his whole life and career and you know all the things that that guy did i think it'd be pretty epic very cool great answer thank you yeah he'll, def he'll definitely drink a couple of bourbons with you that's for sure oh yeah um, i'm a big fan of brown liquor so <laughs> <laughs> hell yes um so for me i always ask the same type of types of questions the first one is uh um, regarding movies and i noticed on your website um the the year of 2013 has a lot of significance to you guys um and there are some really good movies that came out in 2013 so i'll list off three and you tell me which one's your favorite and why so 2013, we had Captain Phillips, The Conjuring, one of my personal faves, big horror movie guy, or uh, Lone Survivor. Uh, Lone Survivor. I think you'd have to go with that one. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, I don't think there's any contest. I mean, those other two are, are decent. I don't think I saw the second one. Uh, it's it's uh, it's the Conjuring, the not the Conjuring. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's the Conjuring. Whatever. It's fine. Yeah. It's it's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm sure that would have really made him realize, oh, I saw that one. <laughs> no, man. <laughs> Definitely haven't seen The Conjuring, The Conjuring, or any of those. But yeah, man. Uh, Lone Survivor, man. There's yeah, there's no no contest there, I think, in my opinion. Hell yeah. Lone, Lone Survivor is probably one of the best um, casted. And like when it comes to the gear and like the tactics and stuff. I would say, you know, from my point of view, which is not very credible, but um, it just seems like it was done very well. Uh, so, yeah, I would agree with you there. It's a great, great flick. Um, my uh, last question for you is, I know you spent a lot of time in Vegas. I'm kind of a big space and UFO and, you know, <laughs> junkie. And uh, I know you've obviously flown a lot around there. Do you have any, uh, have a, or, you know, a specific story that stands out that it's like, Hmm, that's peculiar or that's interesting or, <laughs> yeah, or did you story. sign an NDA and you can't tell us anything? No, man, that's actually a great question. Uh, I've got a couple of them, believe it or not. Um, I'll keep them brief one. Uh, so my agency, we used to, um, we used to have to, well, they still do, but they would uh, they would get what they called a night out of valley sign off, and they would have the newer patrol pilots would have to fly any potential route that somebody would you know be the patrol officers would be chasing a vehicle that would leave the city of Las Vegas anywhere in the county. And there's a whole bunch of ways you know you can get out of Vegas, but one of them is going north up the 95 towards Reno, and you know when you go up towards like that area of the Tonopah Test Range, and um, that, you know, Indian Springs is up there and all that. And they do a lot of, you know, all that stuff. And it's, it's a very large area, honestly, there's a big restricted area up there. Um, so one night we were doing one of the guys night at Valley sign offs and, uh, we used to do it 
years ago, man, the pilot that was getting the training actually had to do it without night vision goggles, which eventually they realized that's probably not the smartest thing. So, uh, but anyway, so me and this pilot are flying north up the 95 towards that area and I'm on MVGs and he's not, I'm looking and I see this, this just object that's like out there in the restricted area and it's like stationary, but it's like clearly, you know, it's clearly like some sort of an aircraft or something. And, uh, but it's, man, it's just really hard to see on the goggles. So we're just cruising along and he can't see it. You know, I'm like, dude, do you see these lights? And he's like, I can't see anything, man. It's pitch black out here. But we're cruising along, cruising along. And, you know, we're super low, you know, probably not even on, on the radar. We're just, you know, cause he has to be low to see the road. So, you know, he's like cruising like 300 feet with a landing light on, but, um, we're trucking along and I'm just like, man, I keep talking about it. I'm like, dude, look at this thing. It's like crazy. It's got to be, they got to be doing something with some sort of weird aircraft up there. But it was weird because it's just like sitting, I don't know, somewhere between maybe five, 6,000 feet. It's just, just literally like not moving, just sitting there. So anyway, we keep getting closer and closer. And eventually we have to call uh, Creech up there, like the Air Force Base by Indian Springs uh, to, you know, to basically like get permission to pass by there to go towards Mercury. And we keyed up on the radio to check in. And as soon as he called them, man, that thing went boop and it just like disappeared. The lights like went off as soon as we told them where we were. And I'm not saying like it was a UFO. I don't know what the hell it was, but, uh, it was just funny. Cause you know, he, he had flipped his goggles down at one point. So I'm like, am I crazy? Look at this thing. And he's like, holy shit, what is that? I don't know. So anyway, but as soon as we called him and checked in and told him we were trucking up the 95, that thing just like disappeared and we never saw it again. So yeah. No, probably a balloon. what's that? So it's probably a balloon. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. It, you know, it might've been, who knows, you know, like my thing was, I thought, ah, oh, it's gotta be, maybe it's some sort of a weird, um, you know, like quadcopter UAV with like a surveillance package and they're doing like, you know, some sort of ground tactics, you know, assault in the compound or something. And I figure, well, maybe that thing just sits there, you know, and it's like, instead of, you know, something orbiting with a camera, this is the new and improved way to do it or something. <laughs> Who you, knows? You man? said it maybe was hard to UFO, see under your goggles though, right? What's that? You said it was hard to see under your your nods, though, right? Yeah, I mean, it, even even with those on, it was you know it wasn't like it stood out super bright, you know. But you could see it was definitely an aircraft. And then you know when the lights went out, definitely it was something that was you know doing something up there. So yeah, might have been aliens. Don't know. Yeah, I was gonna say uh, if you've ever like found yourself in a restricted area and be like, oh shit, because <laughs> I know there's a lot of them up there, but. They probably don't reach too far down into the, to the city. I don't know. I'm not familiar with the airspace there, but it's actually the um, yeah, the south part of that whole area gets really close to Vegas, actually, and um, close enough to where a couple times on rescues, we well, actually several times over the years would have to call and get permission to go into just a section of it. You know, where somebody was, you know, gone and usually somebody went in, you know, hunting or dro drove in and got lost and was wandering around out there in the desert. And, uh, you know, we had to go search. So they would give us a very specific area that we could search in, give us permission. And uh, usually they're pretty cool about it because it's so far south from like the, you know, the area 51, you know, Groom Lake uh, part of that, that um, part of Nevada that it's not. You know, it's not like you're going to see anything crazy. It's generally stuff like, you know, where they're doing like, you know, ground exercises and stuff like that. But yeah, been in there a few times, but never accidentally to where I got in trouble. Good, good. Awesome news. Humble, humble plug for uh, the book uh, Dreamland, Bob Lazar's book. If you haven't, if you haven't read it, it's pretty wild. Um, I'm working my way through it right now, but. That's all I have on my uh, conspiracy theories. So. <laughs> uh, well, I've got I've got two for you, uh, both a both actually vastly different. Uh, one being, I know I know in your bio it says you spent the majority of your time in the air support unit. Presumably, you did a little bit of time on the ground uh, with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. And my first question is, what is the most interesting thing you saw while being a patrol <laughs> officer in Las Vegas? Oh uh, yeah, I did, man. So, you know, I did, I did like seven years as a patrol officer. And then, um, I did about nine years in the air unit as a pilot officer. And then I actually promoted to Sergeant and I went back to the street and had a patrol squad of 10 officers working for me for about a year. Then I went back to the unit and finished my time out there as a Sergeant flying. But, um, man, 
yeah, Vegas is a fast town. There's all kinds of crazy stuff that goes on there on a daily basis. Uh, and I could literally sit here for hours and tell you guys stupid cop stories. But one, one in particular that uh, it's like funny, but not funny. Somebody had called in and said that they uh, in an apartment complex, they saw like blood everywhere at the bottom of like uh, uh, the stairs going up to this two story, you know, like the second story apartment. It's just like it looked like a, a homicide scene. There's like blood all over the door, handprints and stuff. And there's like music blasting crazy loud. Uh, in this this apartment. So they call me and some other guys show up and we're looking at it. And we're like, dude, this looks like somebody got like stabbed to death, like butchered out here in front of the thing. So like we end up knocking on the door, trying to make contact and this dude opens the door and there's like, I mean, music blasting so loud. It's like turned up to 11. You can't even hear. So we pull him outside. He's totally covered in blood. He's got like scratches and stuff all over his face. It looks like you know, he got in some sort of a fight and he's got like defensive wounds on his face and his arms. So like he's bloody, he's covered in blood. So we're trying to get the story. We see there's blood all inside the apartment. And then there's like thick black smoke pouring out of his oven. So like we thought the place is on fire, you know, I don't know what's going on, but it's like totally not, you know, normal situation. So uh, and then it just smells like burning, like flesh, right? So we get him outside, we clear the apartment really quick, and there's like blood everywhere. There's like like hair and stuff everywhere. There's a bloody butcher knife laying on the floor, and there's like nobody else in the apartment. And so we're, I mean, we're checking everywhere. I was like, there's got to be a dead body in here. Nothing. And uh, it, but there's like this horrid like smell of black smoke like pouring out of his oven. So we finally kind of get everything secured and we're asking him questions. And he's like, man, we, and we quickly found out he was basically like mentally ill. Um, but he basically said, he goes, dude, there's the queen of England has been sending like messages to my head and has been talking to me and I can't get him to stop and he's been messing with me for like months. And you know, I've tried the tin foil hat. I couldn't get that to work like nothing. But he said, dude, she she sent this demon cat like over and it kept stalking me and it was poisonous and it was gonna bite me. So he was convinced that like she somehow conjured this like demon cat to that was gonna bite him and kill him. And it was just some poor people's cat in the neighborhood. So he eventually is so freaked out that this thing's trying to murder him. He apparently grabbed it and he started stabbing it out at the bottom of the stairs. Well, it, of course, goes batshit crazy and is like scratching him up. So it scratches his face and his arms and he's just like stabbing it like crazy. And eventually he's like, well, yeah, it, it was like bleeding out, but it kept moving and twitching. And it was laying there meowing and like... I just didn't know what to do to basically get rid of it and, you know, send it back to England or whatever it's spirit. So we crank the oven up <laughs> and he throws it in the oven to basically try to, you know, I don't even know, but <laughs> I guess like, you know, in witchcraft or whatever, he was just convinced if he just like, you know, cremated this cat that it would basically, you know, solve the problem. So yeah, thankfully, uh, none of the, you know, there's no citizens were harmed, but somebody's cat was unfortunately Jesus. murdered by this guy. And, and uh, that's like uh, Jeffrey Dahmer meets one flew over the cuckoo's nest, man. That's wild. Pretty much, pretty much. Yeah, and for those of you listening that haven't seen The Conjuring, that's basically the entire concept of the movie right there. So uh, no yeah. need to go back and rent that really? shit. <laughs> Yeah, well, no, now you've now that's, you've seen that's the crazy, man. <laughs> that's Dude, wild. <laughs> that's hilarious. Well, you know, in the funniest that's the, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. So one one of the guys on my squad, he had to take a crime report for for this. You know, back then, like a handwritten crime report. So, you know, the victim, he's like, "What do I put for the victim?" And I'm like. Dude, I don't even know. Like, there's there's no crime really, but we had to document it somehow. So he's like, "Well, I'm just gonna take a crime report and I'm gonna list the victim as." And I have a copy of it down in my basement. The victim is, and there's quotations, and it says the cat. And it was like, <laughs> <laughs> they were gonna take a report for like you know animal cruelty or something like that. Which again, you know, the dude's mentally ill, yeah. so you can't even charge him. But like, you know, he had to take this crime oh, report, man. so I have a copy of it. Still with like, you know, a lot of this stuff from 
from when I was, you know, doing the deed back there in Vegas. But yeah, he listed it in quotes as the cat was the victim. And then I that's think insane. State of Nevada as well. That's <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that's I thought it was going to be like a drunk person on the strip or something like that. Nope. A demon cat from uh, from the Queen of England. That's definitely uh, that's that's wild. Well, my second <laughs> my second question is nothing, nothing remotely like that. Um, so since, you know, whether it was prior to or since starting SR3, I know just from our conversations, you guys travel quite substantially. Of all the places that you've been able to go and operate and train and fly and do these things, what has been your favorite place around the, we'll just say around the world that you've gotten to fly at for whatever reason? Oh man, you know, I would, uh, I was, I was going to say up in like the, uh, the kind of Whistler Pemberton area up in British Columbia. We worked up there actually, you know, Rob Monday, one of our guys, he he's up there as well um, full time. But um, I have to say, I got to change my answer now because just a few weeks ago, we got to go train with the Honolulu fire department guys. And that was absolutely epic. It was so cool, man. I mean, what's not to like about Hawaii, but we trained um, not only in the open water out there, but we were also like, you know, short hauling and repelling guys into, um, some really gnarly terrain. Like there was an, a, a, like a, an extinct volcano crater, um, right there kind of next to the beach. So we were literally like the first half of the day, we're like working on the, the total, like awesome, uh, you know, crater of this volcano. And then like break for lunch in the afternoon, we're down there, like dropping guys off behind the surf zone and, you know, pulling guys out with the, the Billy Pute, man, it was, it was awesome. And then those guys are just super cool to work with as well. So yeah, I would say that's my, that's my number one right now. Shout out to uh, Josh Yeager with the Honolulu fire department flying down there. I'm not sure if you were able to meet him or not, but great dude. Oh, we flew with him. Yeah. He, uh, he actually took us uh, on the first day on, on kind of a recon flight and just, man, super cool, dude. Great pilot. Yep. Yeah, I, I I had reached out to him when you told me you were going down there because I knew his, you know, his dad did that stuff. I think his father retired, but yeah, he was, he was, uh, my roommate in warrant officer candidate school and, you know, went down, did the guard thing for a while. And yeah, he real, <laughs> very Hawaii, very Hawaii, just a very yeah. Hawaii type of guy. Yeah. He, yeah. He's super cool, man. All, all those guys, um, uh, are just a phenomenal team. And I mean, you, they're flying a 520 no tar, you know, down there in conditions that are, that are super windy, you know, I mean, it's just never not windy down there. And, uh, you know, that thing doesn't really have a lot of, you know, quote unquote tail rotor authority. It's just really spongy and sloppy. And they, they do a really outstanding job with the winds and the terrain that they're flying in, in that helicopter. So, yeah, but yeah, he was one of the guys that was on that team while we were down there. Super great guy. Awesome. Brett, I think you had something. Yeah. One, one question and kind of, it's, I guess it's table talk, but, um, I know you've flown a, a variety of aircraft. Um, I know you, I see the 45 on your website quite a bit. Have you had a chance to mess around with a new G3 model yet? You know, I haven't. Um, I, uh, we're really hoping to, we've got some clients that are, are purchasing H one forty fives, and now, you know, Airbus is pretty much just making D three variants now. Um, had a chance to go through like just the, um, the, I guess you would call it like, you know, the, the differences course, it's not even a tra transition course, but, um, it's just really just the differences. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's similar enough to where it's not like a huge deal. Um, the Helionics is all the same, all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that it's from the guys that I've talked to that have flown it, you know, with the five blades up there, it's a lot smoother. Uh, so you don't have as much of the vibration and, you know, in the, in the D2 variant, uh, that you normally had in, uh, you know, the older versions of it. Um, then it's awesome that you get a little bit of the extra weight, you know, extra, uh, useful load there. So yeah, looking forward to the next class, which hopefully won't be too far off in the future for us in the D3, but yeah, the H145 is probably my favorite, uh, all time helicopter to fly. Love it. There you go. Somebody, all the finally, haters out there. Somebody find all the said, haters. Brett, so Brett's if you know how to fly, it's a great helicopter. You guys are all 60 yeah. guys, man. I mean, how well, can Brett's you... flying the Lakota right now down in Arizona. I fly the Lakota, yeah. You flying the C2? Um, yep. Oh, man. That thing is a pig. I'm sorry. Alpha model. It's just, man. <laughs> it is, yeah. It is. <laughs> but be... uh, the, uh, the Arizona guys down here have uh, a B model, Army's B model, or the D3. 
and I see them buzzing around in that thing and it's super slick. Um, so anyways, that's all I have. Appreciate the love on the, uh, 45 though. Well, I hope you, I hope you get into the D three soon because the C two is, uh, it's not even the same helicopter, even the C two to the D two. I always tell people that cause the, the C two guys are like, man, this thing, it's just, you can't hoist in it. You can't, you know, it's so underpowered and you know, it doesn't do well at altitude or hot temperatures or whatever, but the, the D two D three, man, that thing is a beast. So yeah, hopefully you get into it soon. Yeah, it's There's, been humbling uh, down plug. here, especially with the temperatures and stuff. Uh, it's been it's been a humbling experience coming from the sixty and coming to this to the C two down here. And but uh, yeah, my state maybe in a couple of years we'll pick one up. But uh, the biggest thing we're waiting on is the the map bird, you know, the the um, C two model with the uh, FLIR and all the other stuff for us. So hopefully that comes out soon and we'll all, we'll all get fielded it. So Dave, I know we've kind of alluded a little bit to your background with, you know, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and, and kind of that. However, if you don't mind kind of even rewinding it back a little bit further than that and talking about, you know, what got you into aviation, if, you know, what started out your pursuit of wanting to fly and become a pilot, um, whether that was while you were a police officer or before, kind of like how, how you started out to where you grew. Yeah. Really, that all came from my dad. My dad, um, he was a L.A. County Sheriff's deputy, and uh, he eventually worked his way into their aviation unit, the Aero Bureau guys. Um, so, yeah, he was one of the guys that, you know, he wasn't necessarily a founder of that unit, but had been in that unit, you know, not too long after it was, you know, started and up and running. So they were flying patrol in um, Hughes 300s, you know, and then they eventually got C model 500s and, um, you know, did, did hoist rescues eventually. And obviously those guys are huge now and, you know, pretty, pretty amazing, um, unit there. But yeah, so that kind of started it for me just, you know, when I was a kid, always sitting around listening to them, we would talk about flying and, um, I was always fascinated with it. So really when I got older, um, did one tour in the Navy enlisted, got out, uh, went back to Vegas and then, um, was kind of not really sure what I was going to do. So I actually worked on the ramp for Southwest airlines for a few years. And then I, I figured I wanted to be an airline pilot and, um, started working on some airline or airplane ratings. So, um, I think I got my airplane single engine land, got my multi, um, and it was in the commercial instrument program, just kind of ran out of money and, uh, you know, it was still fairly young. So, uh, but then just decided to hire on with Las Vegas Metro police. So, um, got on and, uh, was super, super excited and happy to do that. It was kind of my, my close number two to be in law enforcement. So I was running around, you know, going on calls with crazy people, stabbing cats and all that stuff. And then, um, fairly, you know, after the couple of years realized like, man, it would be awesome to get in the air unit and do what my dad did. So, uh, once I was eligible, which you just had to have a private pilot certificate at the time to test and pretty much everybody would, would have it, you know, in the airplane because it was just a little bit cheaper and easier to get. So I already had it. So I just had to get current, get a medical and, uh, tested, did really well. got transferred up to the unit in 2007 and, um, kind of, you know, everything, all the training was internal there. So just got, got on that path and wanted to, um, definitely wanted to try to like do everything that I could, that they would let me. And, um, you know, had a really, really awesome career, but yeah, that all basically started with my dad, which is cool. That's pretty awesome. And then kind of what did that progression look like when you got over to the air support unit? Did they require you to do time as a tactical flight officer prior to moving over to the pilot seat? Like kind of what was that process like with the Las Vegas PD? Yeah. So all of the people in the unit are dual trained and you have to go through TFO training first and um, so I did that and, uh, it's tough, you know, anybody that does that job in law enforcement, will tell you, man, it's, it's rough. It's, it's in most places you go to, um, you'll find that the TFOs have a higher, you know, kind of washout rate or, or, you know, non-successful completion of training rate than, than pilots do. So, but for me, you know, made it through the TFO training, um, it was tough. And then once I finished that, um, had a little bit of a break, maybe a month off and then, um, rolled right into flight training. So, um, I was assigned a primary CFI and then while, you know, from there on out was like always still doing the TFO thing. So I would, you know, kind of come in 
TFO at least once or twice um, during the day uh, during my shift. And then I would do one training flight with my CFI. And uh, that pretty much continued on for my private rotorcraft, commercial rotorcraft. And then um, after you get a little bit of time flying with patrol with a CFI, they cut you loose and you're essentially just a patrol pilot at that point. And then the more time you get, it's pretty much like any other unit, you know, you accumulate time. And then if you're eligible for certain things, um, you get them automatically. And then certain things you have to be selected for, uh, like the rescue stuff and uh, things like that. But yeah, pretty much that's kind of how it that went down for me. And um, yeah, fortunately I made it through the TFO training cause man, it is brutal. It's tough. You know, we kind of got a little bit of a, of insight to that when we were down at HAI talking with shot over and just the technology and amount of data that a TFO would see and have to be able to process and do and kind of the work that they're doing to not, I don't want to say simplify because it's not simple whatsoever, but to try to alleviate some of that stress on the TFO to provide more information or, you know, what, whatever they can in that display. Um, and it's pretty wild stuff because to us, especially on the active duty side, yes, even though like our medbirds have FLIR, it's totally, totally different. You know, I'm not necessarily trying to track a license plate moving 80 miles an hour down a highway while we're also moving just in making radio calls and everything else. So it's, it's a whole different, whole different ball game and a ton of respect for, for you guys and, and the people who do that. Brett, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you should have been a 45 guy. You would have done that. That's what we do, man. Yeah. Speaking of uh, 45, when you came out of, or, you know, when you start, when you first started flying with the police department, what was the aircraft that you were flying at that time? So for patrol, it was the F model 500. So the 530 F and um, they still have those in the fleet today that they fly patrol in. They also have an H125 now that they've incorporated, but yeah, the uh, F models for all the patrol and then um, a lot of the rescue stuff as well. A lot of the rescues were um, in Red Rock Canyon with that aircraft for like one skid tow in type stuff and then short haul long line stuff with that helicopter. And then for the hoist rescues at the time, it was um, two HH1H model uh, Hueys that had been, you know, pretty heavily upgraded with the fast boom, the straight, the bigger engine, um, all that stuff, composite blades eventually. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what we were, I mean, she's, they flew those things for years and it, it was challenging too. Um, cause such a high altitude up there at Mount Charleston, you know, a lot of the hoist rescues are nine, 10, 11,000 feet and the Huey will do it up there depending on the wind and the weight and, you know, um, the conditions, but man, just like barely, you know, especially in the summertime. So it really, um, it really, you know, taught me a healthy respect for, for power management and, you know, how, how to keep the thing under control and not run out of left pedal and all that stuff. But then eventually, yeah, got the H145 and then transitioned those, those Hueys uh, up north, actually, to Washoe County. They stayed in the state, so they went up to another police agency up there. That's pretty awesome. And, and you know, kind of at what point did you and Jason Connell, who also did 20 years with the Las Vegas uh, Police Department, well, at what point did you guys kind of start talking about the idea of, you know, making a company and going and teaching people how to, how to do these skills and to help make these other agencies better? So, yeah, I mean, SR3 was founded um, really in, well, in the memory of Dave Van Buskirk, who his call sign was SR3 in the unit. And Dave um, was... So he, he was a guy that I knew for a number of years before uh, he went to SAR and it was kind of cool because we, we were both firearms instructors. That's actually where we met was teaching an academy class. And then um, we both got into jujitsu fairly, you know, early on. And uh, I'd been doing that for probably, I don't know, a year, year and a half. And then he just randomly came walking in the door one day. It was kind of funny because I laughed. I was like, man, you're way too pretty for this stuff. Like your face is going to get busted up. <laughs> you're going to get cauliflower here. But um yeah. So, but essentially, you know, Dave, uh, he, he lost his life during a night hoist rescue in 2013. And, uh, it was just, man, one of the best guys that I've ever known. And, uh, you know, it was just second to none as far as the type of guy that he was in the unit and what he brought to it. You know, it was just one of those guys where you're like, dude, this, you know, you'll never have another guy like this in your unit. Um, but he was a really close friend of, of myself and Jason Connell and Jason, a couple of years after, so Dave and I both went up to um, Air Support and SAR in 2007, about a month apart. And then Jason came up uh, about two years later. 
So, you know, they were, we were all super close. Um, but, uh, yeah, as a result of that, that accident, which basically happened because at the time we were using a, a non-locking hoist hook and we weren't familiar with dynamic rollout. You know, the fact that a piece of gear carabiner could rotate up and over the locking gate and essentially open it. So basically that's what happened. And, um, you know, one, after that occurred, you know, that, that was a huge hit, um, you know, really, really tough losing a guy, but especially somebody that's at, that, you know, that you're that close to. Um, and he was just such a good dude that, I mean, he just, it was, it was a huge loss, you know? So and, and anybody, you know, you guys in the military know exactly what that feels like it, man, it, it just, it cuts deep. So, um, we were really adamant that we wanted to get the word out, um, and do like a debrief, you know, um, like a critical incident review at one of the conferences. And the, the goal was to be able to do that at, um, the rescue summit during HAI, which, you know, is hosted by uh, the Airborne Public Safety Association, now APSA. So um, Jason pushed really hard to try to just take that information and be able to present that out to, to our community. And it took a while, man. It took a couple of years for us to be able to not only, you know, for the agency to do their investigation and to figure out exactly what happened and, you know, kind of all the dust to settle from that, if you will. Um, but then, you know, Metro, love, love that agency, man. I believe Metro Green. Um, but you know, that a lot of law enforcement agencies, man, they're, they're not super keen on, on putting that stuff out. So it really took a lot of, of, um, convincing and, you know, just talking to the staff to get them to even entertain the idea of letting us go do this. And honestly, Jason did so much of that. He really did. I mean, he was so passionate about it and, um, he pushed really, really hard. So eventually they said, Hey, put it together and let's see what it looks like. And it, you present it to us. And then, you know, as long as we feel like it's, you know, um, you know, professional enough, whatever you want to call it, respectful enough, then we'll give you the green light. So we did, we put together basically a, you know, a PowerPoint presentation. We presented it to the staff. They, they gave the okay. And then, uh, we got, you know, a slot, uh, actually at HAI in Vegas that year, uh, at the rescue summit. So, uh, we presented on it and got the word out there. We made copies of it and put them on thumb drives. It was kind of cool. We had his call sign, um, SR3 put on, the, uh, these little thumb drives that, uh, that we had the PowerPoint on. And we just said, Hey, we'll give this to anybody. You can copy it. You can take it. We just want to get the word out. Um, and as far as that, you know, the SR three call sign, basically it's all the guys in order of seniority, they're all search and rescue one, search and rescue two. So they was SR three at the time of his death. So, um, that was kind of how it started. And, and we had a lot of people coming up to us and saying, Hey, you know, would you be willing to do this again? Would you, you know, do this for my unit or whatever? And so we were trying to just, you know, teach, at conferences and whatever we could we went and visited some units um like we went and saw the yosar guys and talked about it did it for them so it just started to kind of like grow and morph and then eventually i i was talking to jason i was like man you know there's not a lot of options out there for for training for the type of stuff that we do it's just so you know i hate to say high risk but i mean it's just it's high speed stuff it really is you know any of this stuff hoist rescue you know mvg stuff um you know fast rope long line short all that stuff it's just you know it, it's it's high speed stuff so um you know there and there's a couple other training companies out there that are that give phenomenal training as well but just thought man people are reaching out to us so i said what what do you think about just starting a training company and it'll just be small we'll just kind of see what happens but you know make sure we do it legal and you know we get insurance the whole nine yards and he was on board so we just said hey we're going to take it slow and that was how it started and it's kind of funny because we we had this um, kind of tactical medical experience with Jason. So Jason's also a paramedic. And then Dave Van Buskirk was also a paramedic. And Dave actually stood up this tactical medical program in Metro within the agency for the cops. And it was, you know, like we called it uh, downed officer survival at the time. And it was like they ran the whole agency through it. And your squad would go up to air support and it was a half a day or a full day, depending on the size. And they would teach you, you know, tourniquet application, wound packing, like drags and carries, like downed officer rescue techniques. And then they'd run you through some pretty awesome scenarios with like moulage and all this stuff. And it was phenomenal. Well, when we started the company, we thought, well, we want to do aviation training, but we'll probably build out that medical training first and that'll get us going. And then, you know, the start, the helicopter aviation stuff is going to be 
that's like a bigger, you know, thing to tackle. And it ended up being the opposite. We started getting calls fairly early on and then it just grew from there. And um, we've, we've done quite a bit of those medical classes as well. Um, that's really not our bread and butter. It's, you know, now it's all aviation stuff. So that's essentially how it started. But yeah, it, you know, it's unfortunate because it was in, you know, the, um, in kind of the shadow of this just horrible accident with Dave and losing Dave on that rescue. Um, but I do, you know, feel really good. And all of the guys that work for us do knowing that, you know, we're hopefully out there present preventing something like that from ever happening again. And there's no way to measure that. You know, you don't know, uh, you know, if you've prevented an accident, but, you know, I, I'd like to think with as many of these as we've done that we have prevented at least one accident. And, you know, if we have, then man, that's good enough for me. That's worth its weight in gold. Well, and what an incredible way to honor his legacy too, is by, you know, utilizing what you learn from that and going out and making an impact and bettering other people's cultures in an effort to prevent that. I think that's very commendable and it's honestly just fucking cool. Um, so can you talk us through the timeline a little bit? Like when you guys first came together and said, Hey, maybe we could start a small company. What about like, what time was that? And how much have you guys developed from then until now? And then to add on top of that question, what do you, what does the future look like for SR3 as you guys move forward? Yeah. So that was all starting around, um, you know, forming the company and getting it going and, and just kind of coming up with a plan that was around 2017. And then, we got everything together and up and okay. running in 2018. Um, right around the, the the spring of 2018 was when we did our first class, and um, it uh, it you know like anything as you would expect, it started off pretty slow, but it started to grow pretty rapidly. And then you know COVID came along and ruined everything for everybody for a little while there. Um, but even with COVID going on, we were able to continue to teach. Um, and when COVID really started to kind of taper off and things started to, you know, quote unquote, get back to normal um, and businesses were back to, you know, opening again and things like that. And, you know, depending on what state you're in, that was some of the other challenges that we saw as it would depend on where we would go. But um, once things really started to kind of go back in that direction, it really started to ramp up um, for us. So, you know, we, we saw a ton of growth and um, initially, you know, we had a really small team of guys and um, kind of look at it like we have the the quote unquote rescue instructors that are you know the hoist operators rescuers you know um swift water guys you know uh, we have a couple of guys that were rescue swimmers um and then flight instructors so um we've grown as you know as needed and we have a, a decent sized team of guys now and um as far as where we're at now and where we're going in the future i mean yeah we've we've just seen massive growth in the last two years and um man this year like you said it's just been nonstop for us so um, you know, we're, we're, we definitely have to manage the growth and, and be smart about it. Cause that's, I think one of the things that, um, tends to, to ruin, uh, companies, you know, in the first five, six years of their businesses, when they finally hit that spurt, if they don't know how to deal with it and manage it, you know, it can cause a lot of issues. So we're definitely having to be smart about it. Um, and it's tough because, you know, we have a, an expectation for the level of quality of our instructors that has to be maintained. It's absolutely critical. You know, not only are we trying to do the right thing, but every single one of these guys understands, you know, like we were just saying that Dave Van Buskirk's name is attached to what we're doing, you know, and, and his family, you know, is super keen on what we're doing as well. But like, we're not just representing some random thing, you know, it's, it's Dave as well. So, um, you know, moving forward, yeah, it's, it's just continuing to explode for us, which is awesome. Um, so looking forward to, to more and more of that stuff in the future and more growth and you know, a lot of, a lot of more good stuff. So kind of looking at, you know, kind of looking at the training that you guys are going around and doing, I know you talked a little bit about on the tactical medicine side, uh, but also listed it, you know, in the categories or, you know, helicopter rescue, mountain rescue and safety audits. Um, have the helicopter rescue is, is relatively, especially for us and probably most of the community is somewhat self-explanatory, but what does that look like when you guys go to a unit? Like how are, I don't want to say how, but what specifically, you know, do you guys find yourselves in the role of doing? Is it mostly classroom moving into like scenario based training? Like, what does that look like when SR3 arrives to an organization? Yeah, that's a great question. So 
really it's kind of split up into two categories. It, it depends on whether or not it's a brand new startup unit and they've never done any of this stuff before, or if it's an existing unit that, that has been, and they're either wanting some sort of recurrent training safety audit, or they want to incorporate new techniques. So for a new agency that's never done it before, and this is pretty common, you know, somebody will purchase uh, an, an aircraft and they'll start calling around looking for training options. So um, we have to gather a lot of information, um, you know, where are they at? What are they flying? They generally have no idea what they need as far as gear. Um, and uh, that, that depends also on how many people they have in the unit and who they're going to equip to do what. So there's a lot of time and effort that goes into gathering all that information. And one of the cool things about us is we don't manufacture our own gear and we really don't want to. And that's by design. Um, one of the main reasons why we don't do that is because if, if SR3 was making all of the gear out there, you know, uh, litters, harnesses, lanyards, carabiners, all the things, um, you know, we would be sort of obligated to tell people when they came to us, you know, when they're asking for gear, like, hey, you need to buy all of our stuff because it's the best. And that may or may not be true. You know, it's it's tough for any one entity to make the best of everything. So what we do is we just test and evaluate all of the gear out there and everything that we, you know, basically teach and provide. And we use and abuse it and we find out what we think is best for different applications. And so that may vary as well. So like as an example, you know, there's a really good harness out there for water type rescue, and that may not be the best harness for if they're not doing water type rescue. So we just have a really good idea and understanding. And then we have, you know, we're a, a vendor and reseller of pretty much all those companies gear. So, you know, we're not really in the, in the, in the market of making money off of equipment um, to resell it. So we don't really, you know, we, we don't mark it up or anything like that, but, you know, so if a unit that's brand new comes to us and says, Hey, can you help kit us out? So we'll go through that whole process and we'll, we'll send a detailed spreadsheet line item by line item and it has the whole thing out there and we're like hey if you want us to do this we can be a one source and we'll just order all this gear and have it all shipped to you um, or you guys are more than welcome to based on our recommendations go out and you know buy all the stuff yourself either way you know we're, we really don't care um so that's one thing is getting them all kitted up and then as far as the training so if it's like an initial hoist training class um, for day inland Usually it's five or six days, depending on the size and the complexity of the terrain. Um, and we always want to make sure that when we leave, they've been able to um, get experience in the terrain and the conditions that they're actually going to be flying in. You know, it doesn't do them any good for us to just hoist for five days in an open field when they're going to be expected to go to 10,000 feet and pick guys out of the trees, you know, or a canyon. So we have to work our way up to that. So we have to plan for having enough time to, to work up to that level of, uh, you know, the training. But generally, our structure is if it was a six day class, we would do day one is uh, the majority of that is classroom stuff. And we have, a, um, you know, whatever that. So if it's a inland hoist class, we have one module that we show for every class. It doesn't matter what it is. And it's all, you know, basically on risk mitigation and, you know, mission planning and all the things that doesn't really matter what you're training that need to be considered. So we do that one first and then we get into the modules that are specific to that class. So we'll run everybody through that and then. There's generally a couple hours left over in the afternoon before we're done. We'll go out in the hangar and we'll mock up the aircraft, show them how we did their fall protection system, um, you know, do some static mock-up stuff with the gear, with their harnesses, all that stuff. And that pretty much ends the first day. Then after that, we get into flying and it's kind of crawl, walk, run. We have a progression of, uh, you know, skills and abilities that we'll teach, demonstrate, and then they have to demonstrate before we move on. And uh, that leads all the way up until the very end where, We'll do typically some sort of scenario based training again in that environment that they're operating in. And, um, you know, we just don't ever want them to do anything for the first time when it wasn't training. So um, by the end of that week, five, six days, seven days, whatever it is, um, we're usually pretty comfortable at that point. And uh, they're usually pretty tired, <laughs> smoked. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah, that's that's the process. And then if it's, uh, you know, an agency that is already doing it like we were um, we were with the Riverside uh, Sheriff's Department guys here just not too long ago. And we're actually going back in a couple of weeks, but they're flying the 145 and they wanted us to look at their program. So we actually did the same thing because they'd never had formal training. So we gave them that classroom portion just so they could see it. And, you know, they they saw some stuff that was new to them, which was cool. But um, after that, we you know did kind of a, hey, you guys go out and fly day and night with us and let's just watch and see what you do and observe. And then we got into like training to where um, we were 
just giving them everything we could to kind of, you know, just polish them. And like one of our guys, uh, he always equates this to like, if you're an Olympic runner, you know, and you're running, you know, the hundred yard dash and whatever the time is, you know, we're not there to cut that in half. We're there to just shave a couple seconds off your time. So that's, you know, for units like that, that's what we're trying to do. We're just trying to make them a little bit better in any way that we can. Um, and then in their case, they had never done open water stuff. So we had a half a day of training in the pool with Quinny actually was the instructor on that one. Um, you know, so showing them how to use the strop and the rescue basket and, you know, how to basically approach and, and um, you know, take control of swimmers under different search uh, situations. Um, and then we went out and did it, you know, uh, at a lake for a full day. We were just out there doing, you know, insertions and extractions with all those devices. So, yeah, it kind of depends, but um, it's very structured. And then it's also very um, performance driven. So we can't move on, you know, until we hit a certain level of proficiency. Um, and once we see that, then we're able to press on. So, you know, it's very structured and rigid. It's a lot of, a lot of work before and after for us, uh, but we've had huge success. It's awesome uh, to see that. And, you know, kind of just looking at it from my view, um, all the training uh, planning that goes into each, you know, each unit must be pretty diverse. And I'm sure by now you have a good handle on it, but to start, that must've been challenging to, you know, going one day you're in Alaska, the next day you're in, you know, lower Alabama or Arizona. That must have been a, a, a very challenging, you know, experience to dial in the training and to be prepared. Um, but with that, do you do any contracting? Are you contracting with military units as well, or is it all civilian? No, we've done some training uh, with some guard units, and um, that's actually pretty cool. You know, we're getting more of that stuff now. I actually talked to a guard unit yesterday, and, um, you know, we're definitely trying to do as much as that as we can. Um, you know, that's one of those things where you kind of have to do your first one, and then, you know, word gets out. And uh, because of the way everybody's different in each individual state, you know, some some units may have a lot of training money. Some units may have really next to nothing. And, you know, you guys are familiar with this. We've even had the, uh, the couple of them that we've talked to recently. They're like, man, we really want to get you guys out here for training. We have no idea how to do it. So we've said, hey, you know, talk to this person over in this guard unit and they can help you understand how they went about doing it, you know, and what they did to get the funding or, you know, how they categorized it or whatever. So, um, yeah, we love doing the military units because, um, man, there's just so many of you guys out there and it's, it's such a tough mission. And especially under the certain, you know, some of the situations that, that you guys are flying in uh, with the altitudes and the conditions. I mean, all the aircraft are just heavy. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of challenges there. So, um, but yeah, we're definitely uh, getting more and more of those coming in, which is super awesome. You know, especially with, with hoist operations on the active duty side, something that, um, cause I was doing hoist operations in the HH 60 and something that I think the active duty component falls very short of, and I'll say for conventional army, you know, obviously the special operations side, they do all sorts of different types of training with, outside entities and they have a lot more flexibility with that. But I think that really for the active duty side, that is something that, uh, they are critically short on incorporating, um, just due to whatever walls exist. Most of the outside training that are, you know, that our hoist operators and medics for that matter are able to get on the active duty side, come from one internal to the army, which I can talk about in a second. And then two, are coming from the organizations that are producing the equipment, which don't necessarily, I don't necessarily think that receiving those classes from the manufacturer translates to best practices in, in a variety of environments. And I'm sure you of all people can attest to that. It's like, okay, cool. If Breeze Eastern teaches us a class on how to use this hoist, those skills don't necessarily translate into all of the different operational environments. And that's something that I think that we are very short on, on the active duty side. And it's not just with hoist operations, it's with, you know, a multitude of different things. There's so much knowledge outside of the military that, that we really fail to bring in because I don't know, for whatever reason, it's because it's always been done this way. And we've built, we've built SOPs and we've built X, Y, and Z out. Uh, and, you know, they say, Oh, you, we have a program, but there's so much knowledge that I, I truly believe that we miss by not incorporating, um, you know, training opportunities from, from agencies such as, you know, organizations such as SR3. Uh, because I think that especially in the med or in the medevac side of the house where we are conducting 
hoist operations. And depending on what unit you're at, you might be doing those in the mountain or you might be part of a search and rescue unit or you might be doing it over water, wherever it might be. There's so much to be learned from people who have operated in all these different environments as opposed to the, the continual rollover. Because the benefit is if you show up to an active duty unit and, you know, the, the med has the benefit of being, you know, the largest type of company in AV and active duty aviation. And so, you know, you could impact potentially 40 pilots who are now taking that knowledge uh, and not just 40 pilots, but 40 pilots plus 25, you know, hoist operators, 30 medics, all these people who can now branch out to their other units and start building those skills that will later translate into massive changes in SOPs that happen uh, because we still see it, you know, it's, and it's little things like what you were talking about shaving off those one to two seconds that you still get people who show up that we're at a unit using different verbiage for hoist call outs. You know, as we go through our, you know, we have a, the, the whole hoist, you know, script and checklist and maybe their unit wasn't enforcing it or doing different call outs. Well, now that pilot doesn't hear what he's used to hearing. And so he pauses or hesitates to give them the clear to, you know, conduct their mission because it's, it's just throwing those little wrenches and clearing that out that I think, um, I, I could see an organization like SR3 being wildly impactful, uh, impactful on, but, you know, I, I really do appreciate your time and, and just hearing about, you know, getting a little bit more idea about what you guys are doing, especially having, you know, dug into your website a little bit. And it, at first I was like, when well, no, a mountain rescue tactical medicine, that doesn't make sense until you you talk about these different environments and I'm like, well, I could see how a rescue mission in, you know, Southern Arizona or up in the Rockies could turn into a high angle rescue mission really quick, where now your guys on the ground having to maneuver in a different manner to be able to, you know, save a life. Um, but with that said, what would be your one piece of advice for someone that is, I'm trying to think of how I want to word this because you guys have such a, a wide breadth of, of what you do. Um, what would be your one piece of advice for someone looking to improve, you know, their rescue program if they are that program manager out there or if whether they're an IP or just a pilot looking to make some sort of impact on their rescue program, what would your piece of advice be to them? You know, the, this, and this will sound like a shameless plug, but, you know, the biggest thing obviously is if they can bring in somebody um, to give them really, really good outside training like us. And again, we're not the only option out there. There's other training companies and they do an outstanding job as well. So that's, that's the best thing, you know, that you can do because there's, there's so much experience and, you know, it's a different perspective. Um, but that's, you know, quite honestly, it's not something that everybody can accomplish either because of budgeting or, you know, like in the army, it's not the easiest thing just to bring in some training company. Like you said, everything is so rigid and structured and there's a lot of red tape and you can't just change your SOPs. You know, they're pretty much set in stone. So um, it's tough. But with that being said, um, the next best thing is for if you're, you know, a program manager or you're anybody, even if you're a, a lower, you know, kind of on the totem pole person in one of those units, man, seek that training out if you can, you know, I mean, even listening to a podcast like this, you're going to pick up a ton of stuff. There's webinars out there, but one of the biggest things you can do is go to these conferences, man, between, you know, HAI, um, attending the rescue summit, the good rich hoist users conference, um, you know, there's apps has got good ones. Um, echo now they're, we're teaching a whole thing for echo now. And they're, they're kind of a more of, originally like kind of more of a medical transport, um, organization, but they're getting into a lot of this stuff as well. Now and we're trying to help them do that. So, man, if you can even send one guy out and he learns something like dynamic rollout, you know, um, or sits through a class, like we teach a class on hoist emergency procedures, you know, so there's, there's a lot of things that you'll be able to go to one of those conferences and sit in classes and learn. And then on top of all that, you get to network with people, you meet people, you know, you exchange information and they'll become a lot of times a really, really good source of information. You know, people reach out to us all the time and we always joke. We say, Hey man, we're not an attorney's office. We're not going to send you a bill for 15 minute conversation. You know, <laughs> we just want people to be safer, you know? So we, we do that pretty regularly, man. People will call us up and they'll say, Hey, we're having an issue with this. We want to have you come out and train, but you know, we can't, we can't, you know, we don't have a budget for it. So, um, but yeah, in a nutshell, if you can't bring it in, go seek it out. And then lastly, the thing I always tell people is whatever you've got experience and knowledge, man, don't hoard that shit, pass it on. 
pass it on to everybody in your unit or everybody in your organization, you know, put your ego aside and don't worry about people that are going to surpass you and, you know, be a better pilot or be a better medic or whatever. Like, that's not the point. We're all on the same team. You know, as Jocko says, the enemy's outside the wire, man. So like you should do everything you can to pour your own, you know, uh, knowledge and, and experience into the, the team around you, you know, for the greater good. So it's long answer to your short question, but yeah, I'm big, big on all that stuff. Great answer, brother. Um, one last thing before we let you get back to your day. If I was um, in a leadership position in one of those organizations or maybe an SP in one of the guard units, how would I go about reaching out, getting a hold of you guys to have that chat about potentially setting up training and, and what kind of value you can bring? Yeah, easiest way. Great question, man. I appreciate that. Um, easiest way is to just email us at info at sr3rescue.com. So it's sr, the number three rescue.com. Uh, they can go to our website, sr3rescue.com, and then there's a contact us page on there. So you can fill out basically, you know, what it is that you're looking for and put in a bunch of kind of preloaded information that helps us out before we reach out to you. Um, you can follow us on Instagram, uh, sr3, I think it's underscore rescue, and um, you can DM us directly there. We're on LinkedIn as well. So, um, yeah, any of those would be uh you know, the easiest way to get a hold of us, uh, phone numbers on the website as well. Um, anybody wants to email me, it's, it's D Callen. So D C A L L E N at SR three rescue.com as well. Happy to talk to any, anybody out there, especially the pilots. Um, it's one of the things that's, that's completely unique and different about SR three is that we always send a CFI to these classes and nobody else is doing that. And we've been doing it since day one. And there's just, there's huge value in it, man. So we found that, uh, you know, we may go somewhere and the pilots, oh, they all have 10,000 hours, so they're good. But they've never been shown the ins and outs of things like hoisting. You know, I always say hoisting's an art. And there's so many things that we're able to show guys that make their life just 10 times easier and, and safer. So, um, you know, definitely uh, highly recommend that portion of our training programs that kind of separate us. But yeah, reach out to us through the website um, or any of our social media channels or give us a call. We'd be happy to talk to you. And again, man, if people are just looking for some help and some info, again, we're not going to send you a bill. You know, if there's something we can do to help somebody out, we're all about that. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. Fantastic. Awesome. Dave, thank, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been it's been awesome to hang out with you. I know this has been in the works for a while because you guys have been crammed busy all over the U.S. Uh, doing doing the Lord's work and and teaching people all over. And it's uh, it's really awesome to finally be able to sit down and, and chat with you. Um, so again, thank you so much for coming on and uh, and hanging out with us. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity, man. Big fan of you guys and what you're doing. Um, I rock a lot of your morale patches on the back of my helmet. You'll probably see those randomly popping up on our Instagram. Those are always awesome, man. It's one of the things I'm kind of known for. So, yeah, big, big fan of uh, of your company and uh, definitely everything that you guys are doing with this because I don't think you guys really realize the impact that you have on the community. It's probably something that you don't get told frequently enough. But, you know, thank you not only for having me on here, but thank you for everything you guys do because I know uh, I speak for everybody out there when I say we really appreciate it. So thanks. That means, uh, I know that means a lot to, uh, to us, but again, Dave and SR3 can be reached at info at SR3rescue.com as well as SR3rescue.com. Hit them up on there or on Instagram. They've got links to their LinkedIn, Instagram, all of that stuff on their website till next time.